it's been six months since we last did a tour of my garden, so I figured let's take another look. So come along with me and we'll see what's changed, what I'm updating and what I'm working on. As we walk down through here, this is kind of the first garden that I built. I talked a little bit about it in the past, but I have my original herb bed here. So this is kind of the first herb bed that I built. It's close to the kitchen. If you saw my last video where I built a new herb bed, it's a little bit closer, but this was just a little too low. I had to get into the fence. It's like a whole extra step. It's all about simplifying, but still looking very good. And I still harvest out of it all the time. Walking down here, I still have a couple of those giant kales that you saw in the last video. These are the last two that are kind of just still looking healthy enough. The other ones got a little bit of powdery mildew, started flowering. So I took those out, but I, I just don't have the heart to take these out because they're so tall that they're fun to look at. And this over here, I can't remember if I spoke to you guys about this last time, but this is the tree collard. I have three of these in the garden. And to be honest, we don't eat it that much. Uh, it just kind of looks nice now. The leaves are a little bit tougher than most other kales that you'll get, um, but it looks nice. It adds a nice tall element. And the, I like the kind of purpley green color of the leaves. And honestly, right there, I don't have anything else to put there. So why take it out? Occasionally we'll cook it up in some beans, but you know, it's just a nice plant to have in the garden. One of those classics. Over here, this is actually, I did talk about this last time is my grape. And it's actually starting to set a lot of fruit. Last year, it got quite large, but it never fruited at all. So it looks like it's finally established enough to set some fruit. I have at least one, two, three, four, at least a dozen clusters. So I'm very excited for that. This is a red flame grape. It's a classic seedless table grape that does well in Southern California. This pollinator patch has still <laughs> remained entirely wild. Uh, I really actually like these sulfur cosmos quite a bit. They are a little messy, but they just add so much color in the garden right now that I just don't want to take them out. And I always have calendula growing in the garden. It attracts tons of pollinators. It looks great. It's actually really nice in teas and we do actually use it for teas. So this is going to remain the wild zone. I'm still waiting on those echinaceas to come up. I don't know what the deal is with those, but they've been in growing now for like eight months. So I'm really, fingers crossed, that we'll get a couple flowers in this next couple, maybe a month or two, because they're definitely sizing up. You can see it's so wild that I have to kind of jump over the flowers. So I have two main beds set up here. One of them's doing pretty good, the other one not so hot. The one right here is a potato bed. I planted these literally on, I think, Christmas Day. It was like one of these weird things where I had potatoes, and I was like, I have a bed sitting there have some time to kill, why not plant potatoes? So you might be surprised to hear that I was planted at Christmas because it's now been four months and they're only this big. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's just that they're growing over the winter, everything grows slower, but they're definitely sizing up. I actually harvested one right here and it was very delicious. I love me some fresh garden potatoes. And the one next to it, to contrast it, are Brussels sprouts. So these went in the ground sometime late fall last year and they really are struggling through these heat waves we're getting. This one's absolutely covered in aphids. I don't even want to touch it anymore. But these other two up front somehow have remained unscathed from aphids. So I'm optimistic that these two up here I'll be able to actually harvest from. And I'll keep trying every year. I just like, oh God, I got aphids all over my pants. I like Brussels sprouts so much, even though they're kind of a pain to grow because they take so long. I just think they're fun and they look really cool. So I'll probably keep growing them every year. And these, these three, unfortunately, will probably be entirely trashed. But that's how it goes with gardening. You win some, you lose some. It's all about the progress. Now, this is actually what you'll see in the latest video that was just uploaded before this. And that's this old raised bed that I've had here. I don't even remember what was in it last time. I think it maybe had one or two tomatoes. But the soil level was maybe down here. So I've done a lot of work to kind of refresh this as you see in that video. And it's looking really good. I put these tomatoes in maybe a week ago now, and they've definitely been sizing up. They have no signs of issues. They're looking very healthy. I'm very excited to start using this new trellis setup. I think it's gonna be a wonderful tomato year. I'm already very optimistic based on what I see. Now, the other main features of this garden are the asparagus patch. And actually, we looked at it last time and I think it was about the same state where it had all this ferning out. So if you don't know asparagus, this was originally an asparagus spear. 
um, like what you'll see. Actually, there's one that's about to, to grow right there. So as they get older, they'll actually grow into these ferns and they'll start splitting up. So this once was the asparagus, it's now grown into this fern. This is how it gets all its energy for the rest of the summer into the winter so that next year you'll get a lot of spears. I actually did harvest, I think last time I said maybe I'll get half a dozen spears, but I've harvested now somewhere in like 12 to 20 spears and they've all been incredibly delicious. If you guys have the space and the patience, highly recommend you throw in an asparagus bed. But yeah, there's nothing else to do now. You just kind of leave it and walk away. So over here, last year I mentioned I had Delaware kale, which I didn't like, and I decided to switch it to Red Russian. And just like I said, this is Red Russian kale. It just, the leaves on Red Russian are just so nice to eat in salads. Most other kales are a little tougher, but the Red Russian is just wonderful in a nice salad with some vinaigrette. So I might need to add some more because I don't think this is gonna be enough, but they're looking all right. I need to clearly work on some watering here because they're drying out, but definitely looking very healthy. So I'm quite pleased with that. As we come down here, we have to look at the eggplants. So these eggplants, <laughs> So Tefra managed to break into the garden, but she never causes any problems. So we have these three eggplants here and a fourth tiny one. So these are now going into their, I wanna say third year, and they've actually already started producing fruits. They're absolutely covered in flowers. So I'm gonna be eating tons of eggplant as early as probably the end of April into May. So I'm very pleased with that. Overwintering eggplant is just a no brainer. You're never gonna get eggplant faster than an overwintered one. So these, I just remember, these are actually the ones that are three years old. This one is now coming into its second year and that one's only a year old. So I cycle them out. These two will probably go, after three years, the production just drops, so it's not worth it. So moving up from the eggplant over to this area, this is actually one of my red wine cap mushroom beds. So it looks a little bit different than the last time you probably saw it. And that's because it's covered in a fresh layer of mulberry wood chips. I have a mulberry tree on my property and I just cut it back and decided to mulch it. Turns out mulberry wood is one of the ideal candidates for red wine cap mushrooms to colonize. So by putting this here, I'm hoping to create a two year bed instead of just a one season bed of mushrooms. So that's what that's doing. It hasn't fruited yet, but one of my other beds has, and I'll show you guys that as we go over to that area. Right next to that is our garden celery. I think celery is one of these things that's extremely underrated in the garden. Personally, it's not you know my favorite thing to eat but it's one of these things that you just need to add to complete a dish, whether that's like tuna salad or egg salad, soups. And the beautiful thing about growing your own celery is that you don't have to cut it all out. You could just come down to the base, pull a stalk of celery out or as much as you need and it'll just keep growing. It's one of those wonderful kind of harvests, just like lettuce, you could do that as well. Really convenient thing to have in your garden. Right behind that are two blueberry bushes that I can't tell you much about my secrets to success. <laughs> but they're absolutely covered in blueberries. The only thing I make sure I do is that every spring, uh, so two months ago, I amended both of these with some new compost as well as acid fertilizer to make sure that the blueberries get that acidic mix that they need. That's all I could really say about that. <laughs> but they're doing quite well. So this section has had a major change from last time. This, from that post to that post, used to all be those thorned uh, blackberries. We decided to get rid of them because honestly, they were such a hassle to harvest the fruits covered in thorns that most of them we just didn't get to actually eat. So there used to be the blackberries here and I thought I dug them out, but as you know, blackberries are one of these crazy things where once you have them, it's kind of hard to get rid of them. So I thought I did a good job digging them out, but I've been pulling out dozens of these almost every week. So maybe eventually I'll win, but it's just not worth having the thorned varieties, especially so close to where people are walking by. So that was a mistake on my end, but you know, it's part of the lessons again. <laughs> so over here though, is a wonderful new addition, which was in a very recent video where I replaced an old bed here with a new herb bed. So it's filling in nicely from last time. You could see I mulched it, some of that garden straw, the chamomile is producing and everything is just looking more alive. Even the sad onions from the video have perked up. I have said they perked up. They have some more perking to do, but they are looking nevertheless a lot better. The cilantro has sprouted as well. So I'm very optimistic about this. It just takes a little bit of time for an herb bed to fully establish. Maybe by midsummer, it's gonna be looking very lush and full. 
But for now, everything is taking, and that's what I'm very happy to see at least. Just really quickly, these are sort of the trees that I have that I haven't decided where to plant. Um, actually, all of these, except for this, which is a yerba mate tree, um, were started by me from propagations from other trees. So I always start more than I need, and then I end up not knowing what to do with it. So that's what's happening here. I just keep potting them up. They keep sizing up. As people come by, I'll offer them a free fig tree. <laughs> uh, but eventually we'll get rid of them all, or I'll plant them. So coming down here, this used to be where I had my two garbage bin composting system. I decided to clean it all out. It was too close to where we hang out. And if I managed to slip on my compost management, it was just a stinky mess. So we decided to get rid of that, clean up this area. Still a work in progress, as I'm sure you could see. But as we walk down here, what I've done is I've moved all my compost into this new section. The nice, the nice thing about this update is that it's really easy for me to now add to my compost pile from both that garden or that garden, and I have a bigger bin set up. And this I actually got from Kevin. He was getting rid of it, so I was just like, I'll take it. Um, and let's see, I actually moved all the old compost in here, and it's now sitting at 90 degrees. So it's still breaking down. It has heated up a little bit. I'll just quickly mention that to make your life easy when you're making compost is you want to have a nice source of carbon. In this case, I'm using straw right next to your pile. So as I add greens, I can quickly just come in here, just throw some straw on top, and that's all you really need to do. It's one of the nice things about management is having all your tools in the right spot. This actually is a major change, so we'll get to that. I just want to show you guys these little greenhouses that I've been using. So this is just like one of these discount greenhouses that I got at Aldi, I think. And it's been working really well for me. I don't know how long it'll last. It's not the most stable structure. But if you look at the tomatoes, like they look really fantastic. They have really big leaves. I almost just dropped it. And they're just looking very healthy. They are a little elongated, but that's fine because you could always plant your tomatoes deep. And the peppers are also germing as well. It's just made my life a lot easier because it's really windy today. And what this is doing is blocking all the wind from it. So they're not drying out. They're not getting stunted. And it's made my pepper and tomato starts just look a lot better. So let's take a look at the actual garden. And uh, I'm sure you'll notice a very significant change here. Still working on the infrastructure, such as the fence. So walking down, right away, you can tell that there's something missing. So this used to be a giant pile of English ivy. I had some jades, portaluca, bottle brush. It was just kind of this tangled mess. And it was also, turns out, a lot of little rats lived in there. English ivy kept creeping into my garden. So we decided to just go ahead and rip it all out. And I've probably added like 30% growing space to this whole section of the garden. So I'm very excited about that. It's gonna be a big project, but it's gonna be really fun to show you guys how I'm gonna take a basically a bank, blank slate and create a new garden space out of it. And I'm gonna take you guys along that whole process. This is kind of my allium area. So you'll see that I have leeks, and these are these uh, Bulgarian giant leeks. And I've buried them pretty deep, hoping to get a nice white stem on those leeks. So let me see if I can pull one of these out. <clears throat> so not quite as deep as I should have done it, maybe. But you can see all the part that was buried underground is nice and white. This is still very tender and nice, so this will be a wonderful leek. Definitely going to use this for dinner tonight, but I'll set it right here for now. Next to that, I have bulbing onions. And they haven't really started, they're like barely starting to bulb, which is nice. So I haven't actually grown bulbing onions before, so I'm actually pretty excited about that. These are yellow granix, which is a short day onion, which works well for our climate here. So definitely very excited to see those are working. And I'm very excited to harvest onions. Turns out they plant pretty densely. So I was actually pretty happy to see that. It might be worth growing onions considering how much you could fit in a small space. I guess I should show you guys what's left over here. These are, <laughs> this is a uh, escarole that's fully bolted. So I've just kind of left it because I don't have anything to put here yet. But these cabbages are a cabbage variety that I won't grow again. They're a Balkan variety that I got from Bulgaria. They just aren't doing well. They might look like they're doing well, but inside here is a flower that's about to erupt. And I've decided to leave it because I wanted to show you guys what a cabbage flower looks like. Every one of these that I've cut open has a flower head inside. And when that happens, the whole cabbage gets kind of woody and tough. It's just not very pleasant to eat. There's not really any value left. 
but I have a couple stragglers of cauliflower and some flowers. This is all basically gonna get reset and I'll probably put either peppers or tomatoes here. I've already done peppers or tomatoes here twice, so I might cycle into a pepper now. This is that new area. You could see it still has a little bit of cleanup. Some of these roots are pretty intense. I know that there was English ivy here and I'm just not gonna be able to defeat it. So I'm gonna have to think about how I wanna deal with that a little bit, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> so this kind of area has two main beds. This one is from the low till lasagna bed flip video that I did. And you can see all the broccoli is still here. I've just left it to flower for the bees because if I don't have anything to put in the ground, I tend to leave things and just let them complete their life cycle. By having it flower, it's still feeding the bees, feeding insects. I'm fine with that. But this is all probably gonna go out this week because I now actually do have peppers I could put in the ground. This bed still needs to get flipped. And there's not much to say there. But what is interesting is, well, not this, this birdie's bed is interesting, but that's not what we're here to talk about. It's a little bit crowded here, but in here I actually have, <laughs> squeeze in, another uh, wine cap mushroom bed. So this is one that I didn't show in that video. It was just, I already showed you two. There was no point showing you three, but this is the first one that happened to fruit, of course. That's just how life works. So you can see that this is a, um, an old wine cap. And what happens is that once you see that black powder on the stem, that means that it's released its spores and now it's not really fun to eat anymore. It's dry and kind of wrinkled and woody, but that's fine because since it's spored, that means that it's now spread into these fresh mulberry wood chips that I added. And I'm hoping that means that I'll definitely have more from this probably in the fall. But passion fruit's still looking really healthy and I already see some flower buds developing. So I know I'm gonna be drowning in passion fruit pretty soon here. Uh, as we come around this corner, I have my sweet peas that are kind of finishing up for the season. It's just getting so dry that they're just not happy anymore. So this is gonna be pulled out probably pretty soon. But over here, what I've been very successful with this year is growing cauliflower. And in particular, I've been growing these cheddar and um, cheddar and purple varieties. And uh-oh, actually this is a problem that I haven't seen yet. I don't even know where these snails are coming from considering how dry it is. Definitely don't want snails and slugs on your cauliflower, but I've now pulled at this point, I think eight or 10 cauliflower and they've all been incredible. So I don't know what I did differently this year. I think I just got that timing right, but I've been very successful and very pleased with how this cauliflower has turned out. You can see I have it all tied up to protect it from the sun. But yeah, like they're just looking really wonderful. And if you haven't grown or tried the yellow variety before, I don't know how to describe it, but the flavor is just better. It has like a more complex flavor than standard white cauliflower and also the purple. Also the purple just looks weird when you cook it. It turns like greenish purple. So <laughs> it looks cool when you grow it, but once you start cooking it, it kind of loses a lot of the appeal. Coming down here next to the chickens, I have some of my garlic. So this is mostly my hardneck garlic, uh, or sorry, yeah, hardneck garlic. So what you see here is actually a garlic scape. So this is the flower. Whenever you see them, especially this one, maybe I pulled a little early, but once they twist over at least once, you know that they're ready to get pulled. By pulling the scapes, you're allowing the garlic to produce a bigger bulb. So it's always worth removing these. And they're also really delicious. So I'm actually gonna save this and cook it up with some mushrooms tonight. I'm very, very much enjoying scapes. And this is the first year I've actually had scapes. So that's been pretty cool. So from here, let's go ahead and jump into the chicken coop. So if you remember from last time when I did the two or six months ago, this used to be a welded wire fence sitting on some bamboo stakes. It's definitely had a little bit of improvements. One of the main ones is that we put bird netting around the entire enclosed run. This lets us put these chickens outside without ever worrying about like a, a hawk or a predator getting in during the daytime. So let's go ahead and take a look and see how the orchard is doing. Get these little chicks out of the way. Fully inside the enclosed run. And like I said, we put the netting everywhere because we just don't want anything diving in, getting our chickens. So the, all the trees have actually been doing really well. I've been quite pleased with how this has worked. There was definitely some concern that the chickens would dig it up a little bit. And you could see like right here, what I might end up doing is, <laughs> these chickens are really chatty today, is make like a little um, hardware cloth cone because at the base, 
they are pecking at the roots. I don't think it's, I mean, obviously it hasn't caused any serious problems because this uh, tiger stripe fig is looking wonderful. So this has worked out. I've been very happy with it. I really like how it's added to the space. The dwarf mulberry is really growing out and it's starting to actually produce. Oh wow, it even has a fruit that's ripening. So I'm very excited about this. This other fig is doing great. And this lemon tree, I was a little bit worried about just because um, I left all the fruits on, which normally people say not to, but I like to try things differently. And at, for a second, I didn't think it was gonna make it, but then it put out all this new growth this spring. So it turns out the tree knows what it's doing. It could support the lemons. If it couldn't, it would have dropped them. And now I have a wonderful lemon tree that's established. So one update that'll be in the future is Chirp, Chirp and Co are gonna get some new friends because we have three new chicks that are about this big. Maybe we'll show you guys that a little bit. So with this whole new redesign, there's a couple other little things I wanted to quickly mention. And that's that we put some flowers that the chickens actually really like eating and that we also like looking at. And that is the dwarf philizum, the nasturtium, and some marigold. So the, the hope is that these will eventually grow big enough that the chickens will be able to peck at it through the fence, which I know that they've done for anywhere that sweet Elizam gets close to them, they absolutely love it. So if you if you have chickens, they will go crazy for your Elizam. I don't know why, but they really like it. The chickens also really like eating the passion fruit leaves and it's good for them, so it seems like a win-win. As we walk down over here, I actually have one final little update, which is my grow bag section. I'll probably keep expanding this. So what you see immediately is this tomato. This is a Cherokee carbon cross. I haven't tried this before, but it's in a 15 gallon root pouch. It's looking really healthy. And I haven't had to water it that much, mostly due to the pot size. This was posted as a reel on my Instagram and you could see the difference in growth already. So if you want to check it out, go ahead. And then next to that, I have a overwintered pepper. I think it's a, I'm trying to remember what it is. I believe this was the Mad Hatter. So I'm really excited to have that back. That was a fantastic pepper this year or last year, I should say. And the final couple grow bags I have are two cauliflowers. I just wanted to see how far late into the season I could push it. And in between them, I have an artichoke. I've never grown an artichoke in a container before. So I decided to start with a 10 gallon bag to see how that goes. This was started from seed last year and it's been overwintered. So it should actually produce probably in the fall this year. Enough of this garden. There's too many things to cover everything, but I just wanted to show you guys one other little section of the garden, which is a surprising amount of garlic. So this is the final patch of the garden. I keep adding little patches everywhere, but even though it's a, a little patch, it's holding quite a significant amount of garlic. This is all my soft nut garlic. Last year, I think I grew around 180. And this year I probably, including the garlic you saw back there, have somewhere in the 250 range. I wanted to have enough this time to have garlic for the whole year. I thought I had enough last year, but we do like garlic. So apparently I need a double. Maybe next year I'll do 300. So this is looking quite well. I have it mulched with this cocoa mulch, which has done a surprisingly good job of keeping the soil moist. Around it, you could see I have uh, one, two, three, four, five artichokes. That one's already producing some artichokes. And yeah, this is kind of the zone that I don't really pay that much attention to. That's why I have the artichokes and the garlic. They don't need a lot of maintenance or minding on a daily basis. So if you have a part of your garden where you just don't have the time to check on it every day, it's a great thing to throw perennials such as artichokes or long crops like garlic in that area. And I think we've just about covered enough on this tour and there will definitely be more tours, maybe either seasonally or I don't know, what do you guys think? Every six months, every season, I'm happy to do it either way. But thanks for coming along and I hope to see you guys soon.